Hi. Good morning, everyone. How many of you were at the Museum of Ice Cream yesterday with me? OK. You, sorry? You were there this morning? Oh, you made it this morning. Good luck. Um, well, I mean, well done. Um, I, I, if you were not there, I have a story for you. And if you were there at the end, I have a story for you. Uh, welcome to day two at World City. Uh, for those of you who are just joining today, I'm Christina Lau. I am your co-host. Uh, we had an amazing day yesterday. And the conference aside, I would like to explain this story for a small second here. Uh, for those of you who I had a conversation with earlier, I am not a staff member of World City, um, or Resonance, for that matter. I am not one of the team. I would love to be. Uh, but this is, uh, this is testament to the exceptional people who work at Resonance. I lost my phone in <laughs> this cesspool of death. Uh, these are tiny hot dogs filled with air and, uh, and, and dreams. And it took the team at Resonance about an hour and a half to shovel with snow shovels this all out onto the sides. And I found my phone. So for those people, thank you. For those people who were really worried and got in there, thank you so much. Um, if you don't know who Resonance is, I can now attest to the fact that they are the most tenacious, <laughs> hardworking, generous, and kind people you will ever meet in your life. So if you're thinking about doing any kind of business with Resonance, I can attest to the fact that they will not give up until they find the solution to your problems. So one big round of applause for Resonance, for Chris and that team. Yeah. Oh, also, if you have lost a Samsung S5, um, a, uh, one of four pairs of AirPods, an engagement ring, um, or a fake uniform, a unicorn phone, they, they also have those for you. So quick housekeeping. Uh, toilets are downstairs. Emergency exits are signed everywhere. And don't forget to download the World City app. If uh, you don't know how to do that, there's a QR code on the back of your lanyards. Um, if you're online, you're already online, and hopefully you can find it. Uh, if you would like to get onto the Wi-Fi today, the uh, Wi-Fi is World City, and the password is Resonance with a capital R. And if you would like to social media and, uh, and find me for photos of, uh, of you know, the cesspool of death, um, then you can do that and hashtag World City. For those of you here in New York, you will have a full two hours from 12 to 2 to choose your own adventure. You can grab a colleague, head for lunch. You can find me. I'll tell you the whole ice cream uh, museum story. Uh, there are dozens of restaurants. Times Square and Bryant Park are all just a few steps away. Or you can join our virtual audience and participate in one of our three virtual sessions starting at 12.30 that will be bringing together speakers from London, Paris, Sydney, and Toronto. The choice is yours. Uh, I don't know about Chris, but one thing that brings me a lot of joy is waking up in a new city and watching New York wake up and also watching myself wake up with my phone that has an alarm because I found my phone thanks to the team. As a Hong Konger, I am drawn to the vibe of a sleepless city. There's just something happening every second of the day. The mornings are filled with a circadian buzz of a new day in the hive. It's choreographed, it's poetic, it's chaos, and it's calm at the same time. Plus, I just got back from London, so I've been hopped up on Super City Soup for a month now, and it feels like home. So to start off this morning, speaking of uh, London, he's going to introduce an ex exceptional guest. I would like to welcome back Chris Fair, CEO of Resonance, founder of World City, and finder of my phone. Thanks, Christina. Uh, so many interesting conversations, connections yesterday, and as Christina highlighted, so many sprinkles in the sprinkle pool that we had to go through to find her phone. Um, if the pandemic taught us anything, or even our event last night at the Museum of Ice Cream, it was you know, how much we would valued human connection and maybe how much we'd taken that for granted. It also, during the pandemic, though, we learned our capacity and capability for innovation and ingenuity. We learned how to uplend lifelong patterns in terms of how we live, how we work, play, and transformed all of those in just a matter of weeks as we adapted to a new global reality. Our team at Resonance has been studying people and places for more than 15 years, 
looking at what connects people to places, what attracts them to a city to live, visit, or invest. And we've been thinking a lot about prosperity of places and how to enrich the quality of these different places, whether they're a city, a destination, or a development. But I think based on a lot of what we heard yesterday, we also have to think about how do we make these places not only prosperous, but how do we make them more equitable? How do we make them more sustainable? How do we make them more accessible? In fact, our very lives may depend upon it. Thankfully, we have an opportunity in this particular moment to take that rediscovered appreciation for human connection and pair that with this momentum around ingenuity and innovation together to rethink and make our cities better places forever. Better places that don't just focus on the function in terms of cost per square foot, vehicles carried, passengers transferred, but in ways that make our lives richer and more meaningful. In a world where people can literally live or work anywhere, quality of place is increasingly important. In fact, it's an imperative. And because of this, we're starting today with one of the world's most influential leaders and thinkers in human-centric design and city making. Thomas Heatherwick is a British designer whose prolific, varied work over the last two decades is characterized by ingenuity, inventiveness, and originality. Defying the conventional classification of design disciplines, Thomas founded Heatherwick Studio in 1994 to bring the practices of design, architecture, and urban planning together in a single workspace. Based in London, Heatherwick Studio focuses on designing for the human experience. His studio is currently working on approximately 30 projects in 10 different countries, including new headquarters for Google in Silicon Valley and in London in collaboration with Big, and Aero, an electric car that cleans the air as it drives. The studio has recently completed the Zeitz Museum for Contemporary Art Africa in Cape Town, Cold Drops Yard in Cross, King's Cross, London, and Little Island Park uh, here in the Hudson River that some of you will be hopefully touring tomorrow despite the rain. Um, his forthcoming book, Human Eyes, will be published by Penguin. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Thomas Heatherwick. Hi there, um, thank you for having me. I think we're living through an extraordinary time where I hope and really believe that the terrible pandemic that we just had and adoption of new technologies combined with artificial intelligence and mass data and some of the things that are coming up and are about to allow something that I think could be incredible and transformative We've lived in this time where it's, we've had this crazy thing of places that were so inhuman. It seems bonkers that we had this sort of revolution that happened a century ago where we suddenly started thinking that we could make buildings that talked down to us and didn't really support our emotional needs. I believe that we've actually been living through an epidemic of boringness where everywhere has become this, everywhere new has become this characterless quality. And the thing that I think is powerful is that when you ask people, if, if we're going to a city, which bit would you like to go to? Would you like to go to the old bit or the new bit? What's everyone going to say? Everyone will always pick the old bit. But is it really just because it's old? Or is it because of other qualities that that has that are connecting with us? And I think that we have been wrapped up in a weird mentality which stuck, which was based around the idea that form should follow function. And this is a century old idea and that less is more, and that ornament is a crime. And I've been told these things so many times, and that when you design something, you must make sure you're being honest. And that's led to something that I think has forgotten, that there is a key function that we've been missing, which is that emotion is a function. So we've made places that can stand up, and meet, meet basic needs. And I get told, well, that's functional. 
and that's good design, but unless it connects with us about something in our feelings, is that really good functional design? But then this really, you, you're there just thinking, well, what, what happened to all the lumps and bumps on buildings? How did everything become so two-dimensional, shiny, devoid of meaning and character so easily? What mindset made us believe that that was the, the right thing to do? And it's been fascinating researching and finding that we tell ourselves all these stories to justify th the why buildings like this get built and how disempowered people feel when buildings like this get built. And so the, what's really sort of hit me has been that this isn't just a subjective question of taste. There's research now showing that these buildings cause stress when you're around them and that they also make you take longer to heal inside buildings like this and that the chances of crime and antisocial behaviour are increased with buildings like this. And you can say, oh, well, that's still very subjective. But then when we look at the climate crisis that's been unfolding around us and the focus that we as a society have had on the impact on greenhouse gas emissions, for example, of the aviation industry. And in 2019, the impact was 2.1% of greenhouse gas emissions was from the aviation industry. And there's been a lot of societal conversation around that. But it's felt like the crazy elephant in the room has been that the construction industry as a whole is responsible for 15 times that. But why are we not talking about that? And so then when you look in America, for example, where there are a billion square foot of buildings demolished every year to be rebuilt, which is the size of half of Washington, D.C. And in the U.K., which is, so this is global, this isn't just a problem in the U.S., we demolish 50,000 buildings each year to rebuild them. And the average age of a British commercial building is 40 years. So that if I, was a, if I was a commercial building, I would have been killed 12 years ago. So there's, there's no way around that this is something much bigger than saying this is just a subjective uh, thing. Objectively, it's no use elites telling you that this building is good and that the public are wrong. The public are the people who pull buildings down because they're the ones who influence the politicians and the property developers because they find no value in things. So the public can't be wrong. And a whole industry has been based on the assumption that the public are somehow old fashioned and just want everything to go back to the past. So in, in my studio, we have been well, one of a series of design firms trying to make things where we're trying to look from the user's point of view rather than from a fixed dogma that comes from above, trying to think of emotion and feelings as a factor in what we do. And so that sort of touches a whole lot of aspects of life around us. And so I've just grabbed 10 things and so if we start by looking at working, we've collab collaborated with a firm called BIG to work on Google's headquarters in California. And these spaces that they had been in before had tarmac tutus around each of the old buildings uh, with cars on them. And the, it, it was crazy for us when we first went there, looking at this part of the world in Mountain View and uh, Silicon Valley that had changed the world so much, but the physical reality of it was so lame. Uh, and so the question seemed to be, how could we make workspaces for people when the spirit of the, the place is that we, us funny little people, are roughly the same size we were half a million years ago. So there's some base realities of our physical selves. But how do you make places that 
inspire a team and become a temple of values that bring people together to do their most amazing work. And Google had just leased the NASA airbase next door, which had these giant airship hangars that were disused. And it just thought, that's a workspace I'd want to work in. So we designed a series of hangars to make real flexibility. And if we're really going to make buildings that last, you need that flexibility. And buildings have been designed for too long with rigid constraints that meant that they became obsolete too easily. But it seemed if we could make giant tents, we could make something that could be flexible if they were at the scale of a hangar. And so when we were thinking about how to really make sustainable buildings, how could we capture the rain, take cool out of the ground, uh, and also we've got so much sun there. And so instead of designing buildings and then thinking, better be sustainable, stick a few solar panels on the top like post-it notes, we thought, well, what if we made the whole buildings out of a fabric, a semi-rigid fabric that is like a dragon scale skin of a, a dragon that's made from unique solar panels. And so the, we developed these and made this series. The first three opened five months ago and the next one is opening at Christmas. And these are like giant rigid, semi-rigid tents which gives us the ability to have very large spans of the space inside. And like Zorro, they're then sliced open to bring light into the interior space and to give a space that could be making hot air balloons, could be making transportation, could be having uh, engineers doing different things. So in, in the, the world around us, another one of the challenges that I think is one of the biggest challenges is the challenge of bigness itself. So many things, the commercial imperative to do them means that they become big in the, uh, in the initiative. And particularly in Asia, many of the projects that we're working on are enormous in size. And so, but we're still the same size we were half a million years ago. And so how do you make places when if you, in that, those images I showed of the old piece of a city and the new piece of the city, one thing that typically makes places more human and emotionally engaging is a scale of visual complexity that you get with smaller buildings. So we were interested in a project where we needed to make three and a half million square foot in the center of Shanghai, where typically what gets built is couple of podiums, a residential tower, and a, an office tower, and a bit that has restaurants and shops and the school in. And, but you end up with this typical thing, and the role of the designer is decorating those boxes. And so this kind of wallpaper design, and it seemed with a site the size of the Empire State lying sideways on it, the challenge was how to bring that scale down so that you, the stress of feeling next to something enormous could be somehow making subspaces that nurture the casual conversation or the feeling of comfort in a, a place. And so we realized our building needed to have a thousand columns to, to make a sensible grid for all the car parking and all the, whether it was a gallery or, or a nursery, or a workspace. So we treated those columns as almost like nails in a fakir's bed of nails. So I thought, right, let's put those in. And can we meet the, the art district that's next door by coming down to meet that scale and the city around and the river that's there and then connect with the park that's there. And so our project is called A Thousand Trees. And instead of putting flat gardens which are heavy on top of roof, roofs and meaning you have to have deeper beams, the load of these Chinese mountain trees goes directly down each one of these columns into their foundations. 
So this project, the first half of it, opened just before Christmas, and it has a series of spaces so that almost everybody working in that building or visiting that building has outdoor space as, as well. We've lived in such a strange construct where we've been working in these hermetically sealed boxes for decades, and then our home life had more hum humanness in it by the fact that you had a garden or a terrace or a balcony, and it seemed crazy that why aren't workspaces having those qualities? And now that's supercharged with, uh, with the experience we've all had of working in different ways. So there are hundreds of outdoor terraces and there's space for people to inhabit in different ways over the years. And we worked with different artists to engage them and put commissions embedded in the architecture itself to create more complexity and diversity in a building that could have otherwise just been singular. In the world of learning, we've had this funny time where you don't need to go to university anymore because you could stay in bed and get a PhD. So why do you go there? Because you used to go because that's where the computers were and you used to go because that's where all the books were. So we were really touched when we were asked to make a new learning building in Singapore to, to try to make somewhere that was a, the opposite of the existing campus. You can see behind me, there are all these very long buildings that had not been built in the 1980s. And they were typically, uh, had miles and miles, miles of these corridors. And so why would you go to university? It, it seemed to us the key thing if you can stay at home, it's to meet people, it's to meet the person you're gonna have a, a new idea with or set up a charity or a business with, and that corridors like this are the least likely place for something like that to happen. And our building needed to be 24 hours. So we decided to make a corridor-less university building. So our building isn't one building, it's 12 buildings that come together. And we had been asked, ordered, to have no corners in each classroom. And so we obeyed, as you can see. Um, and so the building, in a way, is just a piles of these cornerless classrooms. And the heart of the space has lots of gathering spaces where people can uh, see each other and feel the energy of there being a 1,000 people in a building at the same time. Uh, but it's raw, it's rough, it doesn't have to sell anything to anybody. And, and it's all about making spaces for the informal moment where you learn, which isn't necessarily the formal moment. So it's full of nooks and crannies and bits where that ad hoc conversation that can have most power can happen. And it's open 24 hours a day. And one of the last times I went, there were people still working at uh, one, two in the morning, not even working, just hanging out there. Uh, and integrating nature was a huge part of it as well. And in Singapore as well, we had a chance to make a think about living. And Singapore's famous for having some incredible apartment projects. So for us, this was like a research project because most people in Singapore, it's a city state, so there isn't lots of land, but where people really want to live is in these black and white houses where you have a garden and indoor and outdoor can really blur. But the apartments, typically, the glass is all sealed, the, the balcony is dry with one or two pots. So we asked ourselves, if we're going to be more efficient with how we use land, and in a way New York has this issue too. I've been in apartments here in New York, and you're just there thinking, why would I live in a helicopter? Like, why do I want to be up here looking down at the world? What, my uh, upbringing in London, you got to smell, like on a day like this, you go out and take a breath of mushroomy, leafy, muddy squelch from British um, terraced houses. And it seemed to lose that feeling of the earth is a something that's powerful about losing that. And so we just thought, how could we make a garden, not just a few pots on every floor, but also use cross ventilation so that we can use less air conditioning. So we built a project called Eden and 
to, to get away from the idea of a big box. It's garden all the way around, and then there are rooms set in from that garden, and there is no lobby with a piano or a artwork. You just walk into a garden, and there are some elevators from that garden that, that take you up to the apartments themselves. And the garden itself is embedded into that ground, but you can open in this tropical location, designing an architecture that can fit that and allow you to use less air conditioning because by opening on multiple sides all the big windows, you can get this cross ventilation that makes a huge difference. Thinking about, we're passionate about how people come together. And so to us, an art gallery is an amazing thing, but shopping is another place where people came together. So for us, that's interesting socially, not because we're interested in people buying things particularly, but in so many cities, we've had this strange construct that the heart of the city, when people said it's a thriving city, it just meant shopping. So it seemed, how do you make that something that engages people's senses as much as possible? And we were given these two long coal sheds in the centre of London in King's Cross, near our studio. And we were asked to just put a couple of bridges, fancy bridges. And it felt to us that wasn't what was needed. The roofs had burnt out. And the, what, what was needed was a heart. And two long Kit Kat fingers don't, with a kind of windswept route through the middle. How does that hold people? So given that we needed a new roof, and also, in general, shopping areas might be about, uh, I'm going to do it in metres, but um, about 13 metres is considered a really good distance for shops to be near each other, for you to be able to recognise someone's face and be able to tip in towards them. But we had something where the closest these got was 26 metres and the furthest was 39 metres. So it was double wrong and triple wrong if you were going to make something that was really following those rules of shopping. So it seemed what it really needed is, was this heart. So what we proposed was not to make fancy bridges, make very simple ones, but to make a third floor instead that connected them. And instead of sticking a box on top, which is typically always what happens when anyone goes close to a heritage building, to grow the roofs, go back to the original quarry where the stone was from, and to find the same slate that was used 180 years ago and build, make the buildings themselves make a third floor that made a heart and uh, focused and created somewhere where you would meet your friend or your grandmother or whatever it was. So it was about old and new stitched together and then the chance in doing that to make an extraordinary space that looked out to back to the city itself. The worst, worst, worst public environments that you ever go near, for me, have been healing spaces. And healing doesn't even feel like the right word, medical things. And so we were asked to make a, a non-clinical building for, uh, for cancer treatments. And our site was in the last green space in the north of England in a place called Leeds. And we were being asked to slam a new building on top of this piece of grass. And this piece of grass wasn't even a proper piece of grass. This was the construction waste left over from building that car park with a bit of turf on top. And so it seemed, how can, if we know that nature is something that can really contribute towards healing, what if we don't slam a big building on it, but instead make something that's even greener than it was? And so we decided to use materials that had the maximum embodied carbon in them. And so we used giant plywood, a bit like those dinosaur models that slot together, to do that at a giant scale and create three buildings that were integrated together to make shared space. And the using buildable, uh, breathable materials, but part of this cancer care center, part of the brief is to make spaces that people can cry. 
and be alone with themselves, but equally come together as a community. So it's about the social and the intimate. And so making spaces that have details and an architecture that feels like something that supports hope rather than hopelessness felt critical. In the world of people absorbing impressions in South Africa, we were given this grain silo and originally we were asked if we wanted to demolish it. So we just said, no, don't demolish it. And instead we turned it into Africa's first major art institution for showing the work of contemporary African artists. And we took these giant concrete tubes that had stored maize for almost a century, but we were being told, don't give us circular galleries. Um, we need square galleries because we need to make shows that can travel to other places, not in that accent. And so we, are, we thought of, was just sad because there was this, these amazing tubes. So we, we wanted to still cherish them. So most of our work was restoring the outside, peeling off that magnolia paint. But then we got one grain of corn that had been stored in the building originally, and we digitally scanned it, and we enlarged that to be 10 stories high and cut that out of the heart of the building. Um, and so this is the inside of that building. And we worked with amazing engineers, and we focused a very limited budget to try to have the maximum emotional meaning and make a building where you couldn't go to the outside and take a selfie of yourself and go home and say you'd been to the museum. But in a way, you had to go inside. And as soon as you're inside, curiosity would make you look at the rest of the place. So that one grain of corn is cutting through square silos, round silos, the cruciform spaces between. They'd stored corn in all of these vertical segmented zones. And it's raw and it's rough, but there was a sort of truth to that. And um, those babies on the top, I've got quite a view looking down that glass. And the, there are 80 galleries that are packed around that space. And they're, they're simple, uh, but deliberately flexible for a future, whatever that might be. And um, in terms of public space, here in New York, we had the incredible chance to rebuild the Pier 54 that had suffered damage at um, Hurricane Sandy. And that was actually the day we presented. And we got stuck here in one of your natural disasters that you seem good at having here. We have economic disasters, and you do incredible nature. Um, and the so our challenge was that we had this this city that was driven by the hundreds of peers that were the economic uh, socket to plug in the rest of the world and the remains of those in these, these uh, um, piles that stick out, the timber piles, there's something beautiful and romantic about them. And it seemed that just slamming a new deck on top of those piles and making a kind of bigger bit of Manhattan just next to the West Side Highway, that's all pretty windswept anyway, didn't feel like it was the right thing to do. And we just thought, well, how can the piles be the heroes? And a few bits of nature on a flat slab also, you can feel that it's just um, somehow slightly hopeless and doomed. So we thought, well, what if we let the, the piles have three-dimensionality and if they push up that landscape, the emotion at a three-dimensional landscape rather than a two-dimensional one with some plants is so different. And so that's what led to this design and the, the move to pushing it away from the land so that emotionally you'd feel like you were leaving Manhattan behind, leaving the West Side Highway and going across these gangplanks and to a space where by going underneath an archway, it's somehow emotionally giving you permission to leave something behind and also look back with fresh eyes. And it's, it had to be designed to take another hurricane or whatever the next decades throw at it. Um,
but we wanted something where it, we used that essential structure to hold the essential space that was needed to bring it alive. And the Hudson River Park Trust and the Dilla von Furstenberg uh, Trust were phenomenal to support and back it and make it really sort of come into being. And then there's the outdoor theater that looks across to New Jersey. Um, and so finally, I just thought I'd talk about the thinking about how people feel relating to place. There's also thinking about place in terms of mobility. And we were, when thinking about a new kind of electric car that we were commissioned to do. We have all seen that, that there are 1.4 billion cars in the world, and it seemed like, okay, there's a, one of the world's biggest manufacturers has been very influenced by, uh, as everyone has, by uh, what Tesla have done, an amazing revolutionary shift in an industry from Elon Musk. But you, if you are making another electric car, what are you adding to that? To that conversation and so we were being asked to design a car that will have a million of them made and not a concept car and it really struck us that electric cars are fantastic in the way that they are non-fossil fuel polluting at the moment of driving them but it's it's not true that they're not polluting because they're giving off microplastics from the tires and the brake pads and they're heavier in general than combustion vehicles. So the, all those particles coming off the millions of cars are going into your children's lungs or your own lungs. So just thought, well, could we address that in some way? So it's not just less bad, it's positively good. So our first step was to say, well, is there a way that we could make a car that takes in the air with all the particles in from the other cars, buses, lorries, motorbikes, and clean the air from those. So our new car called Aero will clean the air as it goes along. But the other side of it was knowing that there are 1.4 billion cars in the world, but they're only used approximately 10% of the time. So at any one moment, you've got a billion rooms sitting there. And during COVID, I don't know how it was for you, I've got a pretty nice house, but I still ended up in my bedroom trying to not look like it was my bedroom doing uh, video calls. And then you would have calls with somebody and you would see them with their headphones on and then you'd see an elbow in the shot and then you'd see there was somebody else trying to do. We were all disrupting each other while trying to use video conference technology. And so it seemed how funny because there are a billion rooms and most people's cars, the, s the stereo system is better than the one in their house the seat is more ergonomically controllable and comfortable than any seat in their house. And the, uh, the air and heat and cool t control is better than in their house. So one thinking was saying, what if the mindset that, like business class seats in aeroplanes are good for transportation, they're good for resting, good for being entertained, good for working, um, eating, resting. So it seemed, what if we, had that mindset and took, took a car and gave it the, the seats, but then allowed the driver's seat and the passenger seat to be able to turn round and then make a, a, a space that you can actually use in some more practical way. And we were also being pushed excitingly because in China, our manufacturer is saying, Chinese consumers don't have the baggage that you do about your mum's car or your dad's car or how you were brought up. Uh, so our car is called Aero and it's, it will clean the air as it goes along and it has doors that open up like, like you have, might want to live in an apartment that's indoor outdoor. It can do similarly. Um, and so we're in the process now of the, uh, all the engineering for production as factories are starting to be built. So just very finally, back to transportation, but at the biggest scale, in Singapore, we've been working with the New York architecture firm KPF to design Singapore's new airport terminal called uh, Changi Terminal 5, which will be one of the biggest terminals 
in the world, and it will be the same size as Terminal 1, 2, 3, and 4 combined. And because it's a city-state, the interesting thing is that a terminal like this, really, it's a meeting ploy for the city. It's like it needs to be a people's palace, and it'll be a place that you can go and you could work and uh, meet each other, and it's not just about transportation. And so lots of the things that I've just spoken about will all be coming together in, in a project like this, about how do you humanize at the largest scale, and how do you try to make a dent in that airportiness that we've got used to. So I've shown you 10 things that my studio has been working on. What we're really interested in our studio is trying to trigger with conversations like this, with our work, but we'll only ever do maybe 100 projects or whatever over the next 25 years, really to tr trigger a, a bigger humanizing movement. And it seems that we now have behavioral science and we have eye tracking software, emotion in the virtual reality headsets that are coming. They can detect your emotion. So it won't be subjective anymore about how we feel about places. No one will be able to say, oh, well, no, 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 that's just a subjective thing. We will have hard data of how people respond to the city around them. And I hope you've seen in the impact environmentally how this isn't just a, a matter of shallow taste. The, the gravity of impact on our planet is massive, and we need to be making buildings that we love enough to want to adapt, adjust, and repair. So I hope that uh, this can somehow be a call to arms alongside the other speakers who are probably going to uh, speak around similar issues. But uh, I think everyone can do something, and I, we must stop feeling powerless. And there's uh, an exciting time ahead, I think. Thank you. <laughs>